Contemplating whether there's such a thing as a Canadian identity and what it might be has been a national pastime probably for as long as Canada has existed. And there's no way to talk about Canada or Canadian politics without taking regionalism into account. None of this is new, but amid pressures or circumstances such as extreme polarization, could that malleable idea of Canada become too weak to hold all together? Let's consider that with, in Oxford, UK, Margaret Macmillan, author and emerita professor of international history at the University of Oxford and the University of Toronto. On De Courcy Island in British Columbia, Ken Coates, Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the University of Saskatchewan. In the nation's capital, Paul Wells, author of An Emergency in Ottawa, the story of the Convoy Commission, and whose writing can be found at paulwells.substack.com. Also, Akash Maharaj, ambassador at large for the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. He's also a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T. And here in our studio, Daniel Bernhardt, CEO of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and Lydia Perovich, author of Lost in Canada, An Immigrant's Second Thoughts, who also writes at longplay.substack.com. And we are thrilled to welcome the cast of Ben-Hur for tonight's program here at TVO. Uh, we, we like to give credit where it's due, and we're going to tell Ken right off the top that the idea for this show came from a column you wrote last year, and it contained this paragraph, and I'm going to share it with our viewers and listeners now, and then we will chat. Right now, Canada is standing on reputation, but the latter is wobbly. Canada is a wonderful country, but the cracks are severe and only getting worse. We can't pretend the problems are not real. The rising anger in Western Canada, frustrations among Indigenous peoples, profound sense of abandonment in rural areas, and Quebec's growing distance from the rest of the country are signs of a nation without a centre, a purpose, or a plan for the future. Ken, you wrote that last August. I wonder if anything's changed in the intervening months to make you slightly more optimistic about where Canada's at today. I'd actually be sad to say significantly more pessimistic. Um, I don't think the last six months have been very, very good for Canada. Uh, I think we're seeing some real sort of challenges in terms of our, our national integrity. This idea that there's a, an idea of Canada is something I grew up with in the 70s and the 80s and sort of going through all the political turmoil of that time. And everybody was getting all excited about what is Canada and how does it work and multiculturalism and immigration, and all those kinds of things. Um, I think we've actually got a bit of a turning point now. And the whole world is going through a lot of changes. You know, Finland's going through some of these, uh, these, these challenges, same with Norway, same with Japan. But Canada seems to me to be particularly vulnerable to the things that we see, see happening. Um, I, I'm not at all convinced we're going in the right direction. There's no national vision. There's not even a discussion about a national vision. Our, our politics at the federal and provincial level have become bribery politics. How much money can I promise? How much lower your taxes or raise your, your annual payments? There's not much there anymore. I don't see people in this country coming together and gelling around any kind of a, of a central idea. Let me use one example. We've had a massive increase in immigration, which I will say has been wonderfully beneficial for Canada as a whole, really since the 1970s and even before then. Immigration is a real strength of this country. But we've increased the number so fast that we haven't even given much thought to it. All the people are pouring into a handful of five or six cities, and the smaller places are getting discouraged and, and, and getting left behind. And I'll end with this. I think Canada has one of the lowest costs of citizenship of any country in the world. We expect virtually nothing from our citizens. And as a consequence, our citizens feel no obligation to think about the country's future, to worry about the Maritimes, to think about what's going on in Nunavut, to be concerned about the in involvement of the new Canadians in our economy and our society. We've got some real work ahead of us. All right, let's get some feedback on that thesis. Margaret McMillan, as a Canadian with a perch in the United Kingdom, I wonder whether you see a Canada as a country without a centre and a purpose. Well, Ken is right. We've always wondered about who we are, and we've always wondered about where we're going. I do find, I come back to Canada a lot. I live part of the year in the UK and part of the year in Canada. When I come back, I would sometimes think, looking at the Canadian media, that I'm living in one of the most miserable countries in the world. Um, we're very good at criticizing ourselves and very good at being down on ourselves. And perhaps we need to do more. Um, we need to worry about what's wrong with us, but I think we need to do more about the things we're very good at. I mean, we are a very decent country. We have a rule of law. 
We certainly have divisions, but we've managed to deal with them so far in a, in a, in a, in a civilized way, in a, in a kindly way. I think, you know, basically, I think we're well-intentioned towards each other. And I'm worried about, yes, I know we need a national purpose, but be careful what you wish for. Um, think of the countries that have had strong national purposes. That hasn't always been good. Um, you know, it has often led to um, diminishing the, 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 the respect for the opinions of others. So I am worried about the country, perhaps not as much as Ken, but I do know that something of what he says is, is, is something that I certainly feel as well. But I also think we need to do more to look at the good sides of the country. Paul Wells, I'd like to draw your attention to a poll that was taken last February in which the question was asked, does it feel to you like everything is broken in the country right now? And two-thirds of Canadians signed on to that. Two-thirds said yes. Now, from your vantage point, is that midwinter post-pandemic blues or is it something more? Uh, a bit of both. I, I, I do think there's something quite substantially post-pandemic about the current uh, uh, malaise that, that uh, is arguably gripping the country. Um, I have been covering politics for 30 years and I've been following it for more than 40. And, and, and um, I think you've almost at any point during that time, you, you would have been able to uh, gather a quorum for the proposition that Canada was on the brink of disaster and richly deserved to be. Um, uh, you know, when, when, when Ken says that Canada is a nation of mercenaries united by bribery, I wonder what the downside is. But um, <laughs> I, I, I do think that um, uh, perhaps more than usual, the sort of founding assumptions of the country have been called into pressing question uh, by uh, the, the um, uh, continued claim of, of uh, Canada's Indigenous peoples, by the suddenly very uh, dissonant uh, example of the United States across the border. I mean, Canadians used to think that they were more or less Americans, but maybe not quite as much. And, and, and the Trump adventure, which uh, many Americans seem tempted to revisit um, and, and, and continue, uh, has been rattling for a lot of Canadians. Add on the fact that for the last month or so, the, the air in most of central Canada has been essentially unbreathable. Um, and there's a sense that not only that the current government uh, federally is rudderless, but that uh, the main pretender to replace that government doesn't seem to have much of a plan either. Uh, yeah, there's cause for concern. Um, I... Uh, I mean, I, we're heading towards Canada Day. I wonder who would celebrate Canada Day, except in the sort of emptiest flag-waving sense. Um, and, 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 and if anyone plans a sort of a more robust commemoration of the national holiday, I wonder what the, I wonder what the content of their argument would be. Hmm. Daniel, you represent the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, so I'm going to ask you about citizenship, because you, qua you caused a bit of a commotion a while back when you published um, StatsCan numbers showing a 40% decline in the uptake of Canadian citizenship over the last couple of decades. So I wonder if you think Canada is somehow a less attractive country of which to be a citizen these days. Well, I mean, the data suggests that that is uh, increasingly the view among immigrants to Canada. I think that immigrants serve a helpful purpose as being a mirror onto our society, people who've come from someplace else and say, is this a place I want to be? Is this a team I want to be on? By that standard, I think we're definitely seeing a decline. But I think we're also part of global trends. And to some of the points that were very eloquently made earlier, and I won't dare to try to repeat them, um, this has been a phenomenon that Canada has been struggling with for a long time. We're a big country that's tried to create a unity of purpose across great distance. And some of the institutions by which we've tried to do that, like the CBC, for example, um, have greatly diminished uh, as part of a general trend in media environment. Uh, across the world. So I think that there are definitely challenges, but what I would say um, from newcomers and, and, and to bring a bit, perhaps a, a glimmer of hope into this whole um, discussion is that while the attitudes of people who are arriving here are perhaps not, um, not so great, their, their reflection or their, their view of Canada is not so great, the number of people who continue to come and seek out a better life in Canada is only going up. And so we do have this great source of potential of extremely talented people who are fleeing other parts of the world either by choice uh, or by necessity. Canada remains an extremely um, 
uh, desirable place for them to come and the possible benefits that Canada can derive from putting this talent to its fullest and maximal use as Canadian citizens uh, is, is immense. So I think we still have great potential and whatever, whatever problems um, we, we have, there is a great raw material by which to fix it. For more on that, check your column in the Globe and Mail, which, in which you discuss these very issues. Let's, uh, Lydia, turn to you next. You've got a book out called Lost in Canada, and it has this paragraph in its pages. Over the last five years in particular, people running Canadian cultural institutions and media have put all their chips on irreconcilable differences. There's no Canada for all, no political cause for all, and no arts for all. What are the irreconcilable differences that you're referencing there in a no Canada for all? I will get to that, but I just wanted to um, uh, remind people there are several, there are a couple of sets of problems that uh, immigrants face when they come here. Some are old. The regionalism story is very old. Uh, the economic challenges are very old. Some professions are closed to immigrants completely. They'd have to go through the local education. Some are all too open. Uh, no, locals don't want to be PSWs and, and pick fruit and so on. Uh, but I think what's happened in the last five or six years, it's, it's something completely new, which is I think Canada has abandoned optimism about its own project. And it's the question of belonging. It's the question of culture. And that matters to immigrants as well. Like, what am I belonging to? Why am I here? Like, what's the meaning of me being here? And what we're offered now is overemphasis on ethnic differences. Like, all the ethnic minorities, are like, that's now extremely uh, important to emphasize. But what's, I think it's hardening is the difference between settler and indigenous that I haven't, I, something that I haven't witnessed before. And the question is now the big conversation is whether these two can be somehow reconciled. And if, if, if we have two phantom states jostling for sovereignty, it, it's a little bit, I mean, when, when somebody, I don't know, from the Balkans comes here, a Trini, uh, a, a Tamil, uh, a, a Nigerian, we come. It's a very complicated process. You get citizenship. And what do we do now? Well, it's reconciliation and, and it's decolonization. decolonization de these two really strange concepts that we kind of, kind of inherit, and that's apparently our project and now. And that you feel you have no responsibility for? Not really. Um, I don't think sin is inherited. I don't think it's collective, it's individual. But I, I mean, do we inherit sins? It's like vaguely religious notion of expiating for something continuously. And it's two groups, two blobs, that are continuously uh, reconciling. And it's, I don't think it's good foundation for a country. More on this to come. Akash, I've got a few numbers I want to throw your way. I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring up this graphic, and I will share this with those listening on podcast. By the year 2041, 50% of Canadians will be made up of immigrants and their children. One in four Canadians will be born in Asia and Africa. Two in five Canadians will be part of a so-called racialized group. Question, does Canada have a sufficiently compelling story of itself to be able to make the new waves of immigrants feel at home here? I think it does, and I'm going to decline to join the Congress of Wolves, some of my colleagues. I'm still very optimistic about our country and about our prospects for the future. Although those numbers that you've quoted will take hold, are projected to take hold by 2041, it's already the case that our country has not had replacement level facility since 1971. For more than half a century, our country has, our population growth, our population stability has been based almost entirely on immigration. And we have held together through that. I don't see the differences that these changes are bringing about as being a source of weakness. I do think it means that as a country, we have to become better at drawing our strength from those differences. If one compares ourselves to old world states who are bound together by a common ethnicity, a common language, a common uh, faith, um, those, that is not part of Canada's story. And really, it, it never has been. We are a country, given the vastness of our, of our land and the sparseness of our population, that has existed in defiance of some of the worst conspiracies of both man and nature. We have always been held together instead by a set of common political values and by a conviction that we are one people. That conviction requires work. It requires a political class and a, pop a population that is willing to constantly revisit the question of what, is, what are those political values? What is it that makes us Canadians? I think that we err, though, when we hope to see that leadership coming from, uh, from the centre or from the people who rule our country. 
if that was ever the case, that's not the case now. It's unlikely to be the case in the future. And if many Canadians believe that we are too often ruled by, by the corrupt, by the imbecilic, that is because we have a habit of too often electing the corrupt and the imbecilic. If we want to have a stronger country and if we want to have a better country, fundamentally, we have to become better people. And that is up to us as a, as a society, not up to those who govern us. I'm tempted to get you to name names when it comes to the imbecilic and corrupt, but no, maybe we'll leave, leave that for another program. <laughs> but Paul Wells, I'm going to come back to you. Clearly, your, your doomsday prophesying as a member of the media uh, hasn't worked on Akash Maharaj, so maybe take a second kick at it. What are you seeing that he's not seeing that makes you so much less bullish on the country at the moment? I mean, I'm wondering whether I over egged the custard uh, in my opening remarks because, <laughs> look, uh, um, uh, Jean Chrétien in an earlier and more unique, naive time used to end every speech by saying there's millions of people around uh, uh, around the world who would um, uh, sell whatever they had to share our supposed uh, uh, miseries. And I, I, I think there's a lot to it. But, I mean, at this time of year, uh, around July 1st, large numbers of Canadians used to be in more of a mood to say, look, whatever the current problem is, at least we agree on the project. And I think that's been rattled uh, recently, um, largely by the, um, the sort of epoch of reconciliation that, that, that Lydia talks about, um, but also by uh, kind of increasingly urgent claims from the populist uh, resource-producing regions of the country, and um, and and the sort of constant cavalcade of uh, crap that we all suffer from uh, social media, which is a distraction, which discourages from uh, uh, longer-form uh, essays and arguments and 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 and, and community-building. So it's a little bit harder to sort of put aside our differences every once in a while and get back to what we all agree on than it used to be because there's less and less that it seems to me to be less and less that we can all agree on. Uh, I just, as you were kind enough to point out, I just wrote a slim book about the, the commission of inquiry into the convoy. That was a, uh, the, 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 the public hearings of that commission were a sort of a 16 ring dialogue of the deaf. And, um, uh, um, I believe that in that sense, it only acted out what, what's going on pretty much all the time in this country these days. Well, let's talk a little marriage and divorce. And for that, I'm going to go to Margaret Macmillan, because you are in the spot uh, that invented the word Brexit. And that happened uh, seven years ago and the start of many. We just recently had something here called Megxit, which was the city of Mississauga leaving Peel region. The Brits started something there. Are there any lessons in Brexit that you think Canada needs to take take attention to now? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, I don't think Canada is going to leave, not, um, uh, leave, leave large organizations at the moment. But what was Brexit promised was a take, taking back control. It was a very simple slogan, which in the end meant absolutely nothing. And I think there is a real danger. I think we have political leaders, and I think we need to think about our political leaders. Um, I won't agree they're all corrupt and, and imbecilic. But we have political leaders who are pandering, I think, to populist whims, are not providing the sort of leadership that we need. And the promises that were made by those who did Brexit in the UK were incapable of being fulfilled and have led, I think, to a diminishing of Britain in the world, its standing in the world, its relationship with Europe, and it's hurt its economy very badly. And I think this idea that somehow a simple act like leaving, um, you talk in Alberta, of becoming independent is going to solve all problems, is extremely short-sighted and very dangerous. And what really worries me at the moment about some of, it seems to me Canada's become very inward-looking. Um, we're concentrating on our differences, and we're living in an increasingly dangerous world. I mean, what do we think we're doing when we talk about breaking up the country? Where would we go? Um, would bits of us become part of the United States? Would bits of us become part of China? You know, it seems to me that we are not thinking seriously in a sustained way about the dangers that are out there, about the very difficult world that we're living in, an increasingly turbulent world in which democracies are increasingly under threat. And I think we need to be thinking about that. We need to remember what we have and what we have built in this country. You know, I'm, I'm all for looking at the past. I'm an historian. 
But if you only look at the past and see the evil that was done in the past, you're not building a future. You know, yes, we must acknowledge the bad things we did in the past. But we must also think to the future. And we also recognize that in some ways we have been a very successful and decent country. And that's what I worry about. Um, you know, we are so down on ourselves that I think we're in danger of, of hollowing out our country and our confidence in it. Yeah. Okay, you said a decent country, and uh, Daniel, I'm going to take you to one of the founders of your organization, a guy named John Ralston Saul, who wrote a book called A Fair Country. He described Canada as a fair country, and he meant the double entente. Fair, as in just, but also fair, as in not necessarily excellent, just fair. And, um, and I think he went on in that book to say Canada is actually a Métis country. I wonder, for example, the increased prevalence of land acknowledgments as an indication, perhaps, that he was seeing Canada in transition from the sort of English-French narrative that has made up so much of the previous 156 almost years of our history to a settler-indigenous relationship. Is that where it's at now? Well, if John were here, what would he say? Let me do my best. Uh, I think that what John would say is that Canadian history is longer than 160 years and that we do ourselves a disservice to think about it being so short. If I recall the book correctly, which I did read, um, he talked about the early years of European settlement where the Europeans who are today politically dominant were actually militarily, politically, economically, um, inferior to the indigenous population. There were no accounts of indigenous people in the hinterlands fleeing to join the coureurs de bois. It was the other way around. Uh, the Europeans decided that, you know, these indigenous folks were warm and well-fed and living long, and they were starving and freezing. And so um, the history is longer uh, than perhaps we acknowledge. So I think John's view is that these things kind of come and go, and this um, interplay between indigenous peoples, plural, and their relationships with each other, and then the Europeans coming in. It's a messy thing, and that act of compromise has been part of Canada's history for a long time. I do want to also just follow up on one point that came up quickly. You know, we talk about uh, Ken's piece, and it's not so much is everything broken. I think that the wobbly ladder was the metaphor he used. It's about precarity. It's not about is everything so bad. It's about well, we enjoy a pretty good standard of living. Is that going to continue? Mm. And on the, on the issue of a national purpose or serious discussion, we see this from newcomers a lot. They say, look, there are parts of the country that are burning and flooding at the same time. Not only why are we rebuilding them, but why is nobody talking about whether we ought to be rebuilding them or not? <laughs> hmm. um, we come from parts of the world where they're contemplating what to do when the sea rises and the biggest cities you know, are, are, are submerged. So I think that there is a sense that we're seeing now from people coming to the country from the outside, that the future of the country is not um, damned, but it's uncertain. And perhaps we're a little complacent. We're, we're resting on all our laurels, on our reputation, as you said. And I think there is a desire and perhaps an energy that's coming from the outside that will force us to do this, to say, what is the plan? Not necessarily a national unifying ideology or purpose, like, like Margaret was warning uh, us against, uh, quite wisely so, I think, but just these big issues, What's our position? And to the point that Paul raised, we seem reluctant to take one or even to open up the discussion that could lead to one contested, though it may be. Um, there's this sort of just bickering that's taken hold, the social media fication mm. of civil society. And I think that's kind of where the ladder is teetering and where we ought to be concerned. Well, okay, Ken, I'm going to bring you back in at this point because the current prime minister, of course, famously said about eight years ago that Canada is the world's first post-national state without a core identity and no mainstream. If that's true, is your quest for markers of nationhood misplaced? Well, I, I hope not. Um, I think he was wrong when he said that. And when you have somebody who becomes prime minister who said that, he then puts in place policies that actually move us in, in that direction. And, and maybe this is sort of Trudeauian fear of nationalism and the kind of excesses that Margaret was actually talking about. But the reality of it is, is that even, we're not even getting the fundamentals right anymore. You know, if you ask Canadians what do you value the most, they'll say things like our healthcare system. Our healthcare system is a real mess right now. And we're not really, that was the whole question about money and all this kind of stuff. We haven't really rethought the fundamentals of our healthcare system. We've got huge problems with emergent, the move toward a city state economy and society. You know, five or six cities are responsible for driving most of the economic opportunity in this country. And the smaller towns and regional areas are really feeling left behind. 
And those are areas where the immigration is, is piling up. So you're getting in the rural areas a sort of anti-immigration sentiment that ironically is showing up in places as far away as Finland and Norway in a very similar sort of circumstance. It is a complex, different and changing and changing world. Um, I think, uh, I should put it this way, I'm a huge, passionate Canadian nationalist in the small end sense of the word. Canada is one of the greatest countries this world has ever seen, and we're not defending institutions. Uh, we're not sort of bragging about the things that we do well. Um, we're not capitalizing on the resources we've got. And the, the underutilization of new Canadians is staggeringly consequential for the country as a whole. There's just the frustration of seeing a country that could be so much better. And if you know, on the, in the national scales, we come up fifth or sixth in the world and all that kind of stuff, it's kind of uncertain as to how we get there in some sort of ways. We're a great country. Let's be really clear about that. But there's no guarantee we're going to stay that way. And the thing that worries me more than anything else is where are we going to be in 20 or 30 years? Um, I think we're right now we're on a path where we're going to have maybe five or six of the top 20 cities in the world. We're already there, right? Our cities do extremely, extremely well. That part will be fine. But the rural areas, small town areas, the more northern regions will continue to deteriorate. And that's not much of a country if what you've got is a sort of series of urban islands. Daniel wants equal time back. Just, just a second to, to, to follow up on this. I think there's a, another way of looking at what you've just said, to just paraphrase. You talked about a country that could be so much better. And one way of looking at this is not about what sort of decline there is, but to actually view this as a narrative of opportunity, mm -hmm. about the things that we're missing that despite a strong yeah. baseline, there's still all this opportunity that's being unrealized. Just another another frame to, to throw out for the sure. viewers to consider. Let me pick up on that. Lydia, I'll bring you in on this. You go to a lot of cultural events. A lot of these cultural events begin with a land acknowledgement. What do you think of that? Again, they're a faintly religious ritual of sorts that slightly reminds me to pre-communist, like communist era, pre-big events. Uh, declarations that mean absolutely nothing. I mean, they don't improve the living conditions of a single indigenous person. So it's, it's sort of an empty gesture that makes people feel better. Uh, plus, it kind of, I would say so, it sows divisions. It kind of reiterates that we are divided. And there are some people who have been here first, and then the rest of us are just, we'd have to, we have to think about that all the time. What, what I'm also interested in, I, this is, my view, but uh, this should just say, agree. You're, you're from Montenegro, which is part of the former Yugoslavia, so yes. you, you know of your communism whereof you speak. That's right, okay. and also ethnic nationalism. Mm -hmm. And also talk about blood and belonging, and who was first, and who came later, and who owns what, and who profited from what chunk of land, and that kind of stuff. But I was going to say one thing, which I think is very important, is that Canadians less and less consume their own culture. Like if you look at the, if you look at, for example, our publishing world, there's a fraction of books of Canadian fiction and nonfiction that Canadians buy. So we don't. We always had this issue, but now I, it's getting more and more acute. We don't. We're so. I think we're more American than ever now, because of course we've emptied out all this conversation of of Canadian, where public, public Canadian conversation and what's filling it. What's filling it up? American culture, which is so compelling to everybody, especially to us who are so close to it. Akash, I want to stick with the, the narrative of settler versus indigenous with you, though, because we have now, for the first time in our history, a governor general with an indigenous background. And I wonder how you read the significance, the symbolic significance of that in a country where, as we've said, for the longest time, the narrative has always been French versus English. I think the symbolism is important, but I think substance is more important than symbolism it's possible to become lost in symbolism and often it's possible for political actors to use symbolism as a substitute for substance. I think that it is good news for Canada that we finally have a governor general who is indigenous. I think it gestures in the, in the correct direction that our institutions are becoming at a minimum more alert. Often that kind of symbolic gesture is used as a as a way of distracting from s substantive issues that remain unresolved. I also think that it's important that it, it causes Canadians to pause and reflect upon our, our narrative. Like any country of the world, our history has both, uh, it's a history of both valor and of villainy. It's woven into the fabric of our national identity as it is for any country. All countries have their heroes, but only great nations realize that their heroes have feet of clay. I think the fact that we are willing to look dispassionately at our, at our history to realize that there's both good and bad 
augments us rather than diminishes us. It reminds us that we are, I believe, a better country today than we were yesterday. And it reinforces our responsibility as citizens to try to at least make, to make our country a better place tomorrow than it is today. The fact that we are thinking about the wrongs of the past, I don't see as a problem for us. I, I see it as a sign of social maturity. The question really is, what do we do with that? Do we wallow in the sins of the past or do we use that we must not repeat mistakes? And indeed, no matter what we do, we are likely to be repeating mistakes of the past. I don't know what the values of future generations will be, but I do know this. In will come to hold our values in contempt just as we hold the values of earlier generations in contempt. We're having a little trouble there with Akash's signal, but we got the, definitely got the gist of what he was saying. Let me go to Paul Wells next. Are we in the process or are we at a moment in time where we seem to be, in your view, writing a new national narrative for our country? I, I, think, I think to some extent we are writing, in, other, in the sense of correcting, a national narrative that had been uh, uh, too narrow and exclusive for too long. And there's, that's going to cause difficulties. Um, and, and sometimes uh, some of the prosecution of this new narrative is going to be a little simplistic and cartoonish. And, you know, uh, you, you said earlier that um, the, or, or, or you suggested that possibly the central cleavage in Canadian culture now is between Indigenous and settler. It's not like the other cleavages have gone away. I do pundit work every Thursday night in French on, on the, the national Reggie Canada network. And I'm reminded every Thursday as I prep for that panel that Francophone, Anglophone, uh, disputes uh, persist uh, during COVID and especially in the late stages of the lockdown, you can make a strong argument that one of the pertinent divisions in Canada was between people who can work with a webcam and people who actually have to show up. Uh, you know, so there's, there, there, there's all kinds of uh, 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 potential reasons for dispute. And I, I want to reiterate that uh, we are in a post-COVID uh, global funk the dimensions of which countries around the world are, are, are only beginning to chart and, 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 and begin to try to navigate. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a spiritual recession that I think we'd be a little nuts to be in denial about. And uh, that makes everything harder, like from, from getting someone to uh, fix your dishwasher to holding a nation together. And uh, I, I'm not sure of a country, I'm not, the countries that I keep an eye on, France, Britain, the United States, Poland, a bunch of others, all seem to be uh, in uh, an extended bout of existential angst. So, I mean, perhaps the good news is we have a lot of company. Paul, I, I, I'm going to do a fast follow-up with you here, and I don't want anybody to think this is a facetious question, because it's certainly not meant to be. That post-COVID funk might have gone away had the Maple Leafs or the Edmonton Oilers won the Stanley Cup and we'd had a big national parade and had a ton of fun. Would you agree with that? Uh, sure, for those of you who care about those uh, sports. I presume you're discussing <laughs> hockey. Uh, oh, Paul, you, I, you know, I, I like your work so much, but some days you're so disappointing to me. But that's another story. <laughs> All right, I understand. All right, moving right along. Uh, Margaret, maybe I could get you to weigh in on that issue of whether or not we're actually trying to write a new national narrative or mythology right now. Well, nations are always doing that. I mean, that's part of what history is about. Um, I think it should be written as honestly as possible. It should look at the evidence. What concerns me, I think, is too much focus on the past means that you're not looking at the present, you're not looking at the, the problems of the present, and you're not thinking about the future. And if you look at the past only to search for what we did wrong, of course you can find examples of it, just as you can find um, examples on the other side. We shouldn't be looking at the past to find only what we did right. I think what we need to do is approach the past with a sense of openness, with a sense of humility. Yes, they made mistakes and they did awful things, and we're doing the same. Um, as one of your, your other guests said, you know, 50 years from now we're going to look at what we've been doing, or people will be looking at what we've been doing and saying, how could they have done it? Um, I think there's a certain amount of humility. And I think we should not use, I think too much we're seeing history being used as a weapon, which is dangerous. We, we know where that can lead. I mean, I think what we should be doing is debating. We should be talking about it. We should be arguing about it. I'm all for that. But we should be doing so, I, I think, in a spirit of, of looking to tr try and understand what actually happened and, and listening to the others. I think so much of what's happening now is people shouting at each other. 
I mean, the, 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 what's happened to political and other sorts of discourse, I think, is really unfortunate. It may be partly a result of COVID. Um, it seems to me there's an anger in the air and, and a discourtesy in the air, which wasn't there a few years ago, not as much anyway. Ken, I want to put two recent events to you and have you tell us what you think they say about our new national narrative or, or, or our attempts at any rate to find a new national narrative. First thing, a $10 billion settlement announced between the Robinson Huron First Nations, Ontario and the federal government. Historic and big. Second thing, National Capital Commission approves the Algonquin name Kichizibi Mikan to replace the name Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway. Okay, fire away. What does that tell us? So you're going to be hard pressed to find a country that would abandon its first prime minister in the way that we've abandoned John A. Macdonald. Uh, I really like the idea of renaming things. We should be doing this on a very regular basis, thinking about the names we've used and deciding which ones reflect our current values and attitudes. I have no problem with changing names and bringing indigenous names. We saw this in Australia and New Zealand. It was a huge part of real reconciliation. Work better in New Zealand than it did in Australia. So I think that part fascinating. The Robinson Treaty is an absolutely fascinating one. This is a situation where in 1850, the government of then the United Province of the Canada signed a treaty with First Nations in the area around, around Lake, Lake Huron, um, and then subsequently ignored big parts of it. It had an escalator clause that said, if you actually get some money off this land, you have to increase our annuity. And the government didn't do that. And they were asked by First Nations to do it repeatedly. So they come up with this, what's believed to be a $10 billion, think of that number, $10 billion from the 21 First Nations around the, involved in that area, who are going to benefit from that directly. But that's actually going backwards. That's resolving the historic grievances. The most important part is you're now negotiating a package going forward that will ensure that Indigenous people are, are beneficiaries, financial, economic, employment beneficiaries of resource and other developments on their traditional territories. This part of the development is actually really exciting. If we look for reasons for optimism, I actually see it in the Indigenous communities. The leadership in the Indigenous communities is unbelievable. These are people who could make much easier and more remunerative lives if they went away from Indigenous politics. They believe in their communities. They're fighting for language, fighting for culture, doing some unbelievable things. And, and we're not paying enough attention to that part of the story. So way more attention to re residential schools, which deserve an awful lot of attention. But look what First Nations are doing to sort of bring their, show their resilience and come back in line with the with the 21st century. So yeah, there's a new narrative sort of coming. Um, I'm not sure we're building one. Our academic system is designed to be anti-narrative, uh, designed to sort of deconstruct any sort of sense of the future and sense of the past that actually has any kind of coherence to it. Um, I think we have to do an awful lot better and whereas public intellectuals and journalists and, and people who speak out on these kinds of issues to actually give Canada a sense of destiny. And it's an historic one. We did really well over a long period of time. It's troubled right now, in my view. It could be great again. I'm not sure if we're going to get there. Uh, you got to watch that expression, make Canada great again. Okay, Ken, <laughs> just uh, putting, putting, putting a little fair warning there. Let's linger here for a second. Margaret, uh, from your perch, again, over in uh, Western Europe, can you imagine a Western, or any country in Europe for that matter, doing what we just did in terms of that financial reconciliation with First Peoples, and changing the name of a significant roadway away from our first prime minister and towards an indigenous representation? Not perhaps as dramatically. I think a number of European countries have questioned past political leaders. Certainly in the UK, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of questioning of Winston Churchill, for example, who in many ways was a great man, but also had retrograde and, and in some cases racist views on Indians, for example, um, was not prepared to give up the British Empire, um, was very right-wing on certain issues. Um, I think the questioning is fine, and I think changing names is fine, although I, in a way I'd rather see the money spent on, on perhaps more useful things than, than making a whole lot of new street signs. But sometimes you have to take statues down, and sometimes you have to make the gesture. Where possible, I would like to see us discuss the complexity of the past. Um, you know, I'm always worried. I mean, we need a story. We need to know where we came from. But I'm always worried about the idea that you want a single narrative. Um, narratives change. I mean, when I was a university student, there weren't women much in the narrative of Canadian history or much in anyone's history. And that, that is a narrative that's changed. But I worry about the teaching 
in our schools, in Canadian schools, about our own past, about our literature. I mean, I think Lydia's point is very important. And what's happened to the publishing of Canadian works is really worrying. What's happened to the CBC, for example, which used to do original Canadian drama, it hasn't been able to do it for years. And these are institutions which help us to think about ourselves and reflect ourselves. And so I think if we're going to think about ourselves, yes, we need to sometimes make changes in the things we see and the things we do, but I think we also need to try and understand that the past is complicated. So John A. Macdonald said things that we don't approve of, but he also created this country. So what do you do? Do you try and forget about him completely? I think that's absolutely idiotic. Well, as Michael Ignati once said on this program, we have to learn how to have two competing ideas in our heads at the same time. <laughs> and until we do, we're going to continue to have these fights. Lydia, I want to just uh, tap into your background a bit here. How many years ago did you come from Montenegro to Canada? About 23. 23 years ago. Could you compare the Canada that was calling out to you back then with the Canada our country is becoming today? Well, yes. Uh, I left the Balkanization behind to find myself in a Canada that's kind of balkanizing again. Um, it, was, uh, it was a promise of an uh, ethnically agnostic country. It didn't matter what your ethnicity is, what your religion was. Ah, we kind of will we'll, we'll wake, we'll make it. I think its instincts were always kind of red Tory, nothing sudden, nothing radical change, but gradual, gradual changes. And we'll somehow, we'll somehow make it work. Very, very decentralized. Um, and interesting in its, interested in its culture back then. It was very interested. And I think maybe we're, we're looking at the last days of Canadian culture and Canadian literature. Uh, maybe we're the last generation for a variety of reasons. I mean, if you look at the Canada Council, for example, they've recently uh, announced basically a five-year political program uh, that's ideological. Uh, it's all about decolonization. This is how we're going to support the countries. That's not the job of an artist. And that's one of the reasons nobody wants to read our books and, and look at our plays, because they have an ideological program, a lot of, a lot of these. So I worry about these things, it, what we read, what we see, what kind of music we listen to. I mean, one of, my, one of the chapters in my book is the list of all the things that mean Canada to me. It then helped me. That helped me understand Canada. And there's operas, there's uh, works of literature, there's paintings. And if you ask people now, what is your list of Canada? Would people come up with four, four or five things max? Like, hmm. just ask people in your life. Give me a list of Canadian cultural products that mean something to you. I'd be curious to see how, how many people come up with. Let's do the experiment right now. Fire away, Daniel. What's on your list? <laughs> well, the Beaverton just did a list of t Canada's top 10 gourds ranked. I think it was a... You yeah. can't be light on this. <laughs> okay, hang on. Light, Lightfoot? Uh, yeah, Downey? Lightfoot, Downey, Howe, How, Pinsent. Pinsent? Yeah, oh, there, there, was, there were some others. We're doing okay. Um, well, I think that we've talked a lot about media. Uh, we've talked a lot about art and culture. I think that if you read, as I once did because of my past job as an advocate for public broadcasting, some of the debates around the first Broadcasting Act in the 1920s and 30s, actually this was the same discussion uh, about American culture coming in. There were ads on their radio, and which British. we thought, British yeah, and British, culture. which we thought were in poor taste. We have our own issues, our own, um, our own matters to discuss. And of course, it was a conservative government that created the CBC with the purpose of unifying the country with a national purpose, um, without mandating what that purpose should be, but creating a forum in which the imagination could be unified across great distance. So the point is, is that this uh, issue has been around for a while. I think it's inherent to our geography, to our proximity to the United States, to the fact that we're fairly few people in a fairly big place. And like any union, you got to work at it. Mm -hmm. And the precarity, I think, that, we're, uh, that we are feeling, that we're intuiting, that we're expressing today, has to do, I think, with the fact that we're not working at it, that the big issues are not really being discussed, um, that the, what a colleague of mine used to call the vomitorium uh, of Twitter, <laughs> that those dynamics have come to characterize civil society. And we see this malaise, therefore, resulting among Canadians. We see it among young people. I mean, today, if in Toronto, where we're sitting, there is a municipal election. And uh, in the last municipal election, six, seven months ago, only 29% of people who are citizens bothered to vote. We're now wondering why immigrants who are coming here don't find citizenship to be very desirable. They're looking at the people who have it and they say, well, if you don't want to use it, why should I? You know, pay my 600 bucks and go through the whole thing and swear to the king when I don't really feel like it. So we, we need to look at the 
uh, people who are coming in, I think, as an important reflection, but also as a source of opportunity. This has been a battle we've been fighting forever. The fact that we've been able to fight it without fighting each other, I think, is actually a major accomplishment of our history. The banality of it, perhaps, has been to our advantage. But the precarity, therefore, is always present. And if we don't find a path through it, or at least put these things on the table, there's always a chance that we wobble and fall. I want to get Paul Wells back in here, even though he knows not a damn thing about sports. How he got booked on this program, I'll never know. But anyway, Paul, Paul will know I'm kidding with him because I'm a subscriber to his Substack, and he never leaves me disappointed. He's a great writer. And you recently wrote that an adaptable country is good at forward thinking in order to spot long-term threats. And I wonder whether you think the lack of a national identity, if in fact we don't have one, is a long-term threat. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. At, at, at some point, a country that doesn't know why it exists is, is, is going to give in to centrifugal uh, pressures. Uh, but I, my, my sense is that um, those pressures are often overstated and that uh, a general sense among the broader Canadian uh, population that uh, what are those eggheads on the TV complaining about uh, is still pretty strong. Like, I think if you asked most people, um, uh, how, how's your week been? Uh, they would, you know, they would, uh, they would say it's been fine. Thanks very much. You know, there's, I, I, think, I think a lot of people living in big cities today are concerned about the state of, of their downtowns. Uh, I, I, I think there's a, 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 a generalized sense among people who like to uh, read and argue about the sort of things that we're des describing that um, it's a lonely existence these days. I mean, there's, in 1997, I could have named you a dozen recent books about the, 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 the uh, Canadian project uh, that were worth discussing. There are fewer such books now, uh, you know, but... Um, uh, uh, I, I think our politics and our communications culture are oriented uh, in important and recent ways to uh, the short-term win, the uh, uh, simplest possible argument that can win the day in ways that are antagonistic to more thoughtful discourse. Mm. Uh, that's been a theme in my journalism for a while. It's going to be a, a, a theme in my, in my journalism this summer. And I'm not sure what's to be done about it, because everybody who's in politics will tell you that uh, they simply can't afford the luxury of a nuanced uh, conversation about what might be or what used to be. Uh, they have to claim um, uh, perfect virtue uh, in, uh, in ways that play well on Instagram. And uh, I think that's increasingly toxic to a more thoughtful discourse in our country. Akash, what about it? The lack of a national identity? Do you think we lack one? And if so, is that a real long-term threat to the country? I think that if Canada did have a lack of a national identity, it would be a long-term threat to us. But if it were the case that we had no identity, we would not spend so long wringing our hands over who and what we are. Okay. We're, we're, unfortunately, his screen is freezing up again, so we are going to just move on and say... Ken, you also wrote in your piece that we need new approaches for these unprecedented times, and we need them now. Okay, here's your chance. What do we need? We need to actually take productivity and economic development seriously. We seem to really think the economy will look after itself. It won't. We actually have to have a really comprehensive process in that regard. We need to rethink the role that social media is having. Social media is a cancer. Um, and it's actually destroying our public life and destroying our intellectual conversations in some absolutely horrible, horrible ways. Um, I think we need to, need to rethink some of our aspects of education. We have a we have you know, 13 different education systems in the country, not counting the, the Catholic ones and the private school ones. And we are completely fragmented in terms of our education, and we're not doing particularly well in some of the basic skills. We are not preparing ourselves for a 21st century economy. The world is going to change very fast. We're changing very, very slowly. And we sort of just rest on the laurels of our resource economy at the same time that we're kicking out the foundations out from underneath it. So we need to be realistic about where we're going economically and how that sort of supports our social network and our social system and, and things of that sort. And I actually think we do need um, not, a, not a prescriptive, you know, forced fed from the top national identity. We need a real national conversation. I would say this, that one of the greatest concerns I have right now 
is not the passions about that are fragmenting this country, but the absence of passion. People are not debating these issues. The Maritimes, not as frustrated with Canada as they were 30 and 40 years ago. Western Canada, uh, we, you want to see some anger. I'm to Saskatchewan, uh, with the heart, the, the heart and center of, of conservatism, taken over from Alberta, right? Um, but, but, but generally, we're not yelling and screaming at each other, and that sort of speaks to a, a, a divorce that's impending, a relationship that's sort of falling apart. Uh, I was interested in Paul talking about the fact that you know, you're on the French Canadian radio and you hear about French English issues. You don't hear that in the rest of the country. In fact, France has gone, or Quebec has gone off into its own little world, does what it wants to do, and the rest of the country pays virtually no attention. Those things concern me the lack of interest, lack of passion, lack of commitment. All right, here's, uh, I'm going to bring another voice into the conversation here. This is Ginny Roth, who writes on the hubs.ca and admittedly comes from things from a more conservative point of view. And she wrote the following. What if we could build a common identity, inculcate a shared national vision, and address some of our economy's biggest challenges all at once? 18-year-old Canadians should be required to perform a mandatory year of service. In the military or caring for seniors or children, they should be encouraged to serve in a place they didn't grow up in and meet people different from themselves. It could bolster our ailing military, inject long-term care homes and child care centers with the labor they desperately need increase birth rates and cure loneliness. And it would give us something meaningful to celebrate on Canada Day, a shared national identity. Margaret McMillan, start us off on this. What do you think of that idea? Um, I'm slightly speechless. Um, I, mean, I mean, I'm all for young people learning to do service, but the idea that this will somehow solve all our problems, um, I'm not so sure. And, and how on earth is it to be done? No, I mean, I think we need we need more than that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I understand we need to know more about each other. We, I want to encourage young people to travel around the country. I mean, that was something that the Company of Young Canadians did um, when the senior troop Trudeau set it up. So I suppose there's something in it, but the idea that it's going to solve everything, I, I, I'm still thinking about that, and I'm not sure I, I see it as a solve-all. Akash, what about you? Well, I think it's interesting that there used to be programs similar to that run by civil society like Katimovic or Canada World Youth, some of which are still going, some of which are no longer are no longer going. What, again, I don't think there's any panacea, but what I do like, think is attractive about that idea is that it places the emphasis on the reality that the creation of a shared national identity doesn't come from the state, it comes from the nation. It comes from the interaction of people, and especially people from different backgrounds. I don't think that kind of consensus can be forged by compelling people into, into some form of national service or volunteerism. But I think it can be catalyzed if those opportunities become more accessible to a broader range of people. We are living through an age of tremendous polarization, not just political, but also economic. And as a result, the per percentage of Canadians who have an opportunity to travel to our country to get to know other Canadians in different parts of a highly regionalized state has diminished, not increased, even as the fact, even as travel becomes easier and even as communication becomes more frictionless, I think ultimately that some form of a stronger national identity comes from greater conversations and not greater consensus, but a greater willingness to understand and to celebrate our differences. That comes from Canadians talking to one another. It does not come from the state talking down to us. Daniel, what say you? Well, our organization has a program called the Canoe Access Pass, which gives new immigrants to Canada free entry to over 1,400 parks, science centers, uh, museums, galleries, etc. for a year. Our view is that people will discover Canada that way and that the country is a classroom. In other words, we're not actually telling them, this is what it means to be Canadian, this is what you do, this is what you wear, this is what you think. We just say, go out, meet people with common interests, explore, have fun. There's a lot of sports games. They're all going to the Argos game on July 3rd. They might see you there, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Argos fan, right, if I remember correctly? No. Oh, man, I'm from <laughs> Hamilton. Give me a break. There you go. I can tease the host and get away with it. Um, and I think this uh, supports a lot what Akash is talking about, that if we create opportunities for people to connect with each other without imposing a, a worldview on them, good things happen. Uh, national unity, purpose, whatever, may not be so neat and tidy, but I think what we're really looking for in this program, what we see from newcomers, they desire, but also I think what a lot of the other guests are talking about is a sense of belief, self-confidence. Like, does anyone stand up in the morning and look at the politicians and say, that person really believes that this problem can be solved. They've got a can-do attitude. They're just gonna go get it and we're gonna get it done. Housing 
you know, all affordability. We hear all the complaints, but no one seems to believe that we can do it. And just to come back to sports at the very last minute, because I think there's a, a, an element of truth here. You're at a ball game. Your team hits a home run or scores an important goal or whatever it is. You, you know, give a hug or a high five to the person next to you. You're enthusiastic. You're on the same team. Do you ever ask them who they voted for? Like, there's a sense of connection in that type of purpose and belief that our team can do it and look, just did it. And I think that Canada needs to be cool again uh, and that we can start right now by believing that there are good things about this place. That's where the cultural aspect comes in, that, you know, there was this band called The Tragically Hip, which is definitely my favorite band, and they thought it was fine to write about obscure towns, and so did Stomp and Tom, and so did Gord Lightfoot, and all these people, and people in the States bought it. We were not so shy and ashamed of ourselves to think that that wasn't worth it. And I think with a certain sense of esteem, not chauvinism, just esteem, just belief, I think a lot of these types of questions can be resolved without having to impose some kind of content onto the discussion mm -hmm. to say this is what it means to be Canadian. Lydia, in the former Yugoslavia, did they have a year's mandatory service for young people? They did have some sort of that, did yes. Did it work to creating a national... Bizarrely, I think it did in yeah. some ways. Should um, we do it here? I don't think people will go for it. I mean, a lot of us already volunteer through the NGO sector and... Uh, uh, I volunteer for Big Brother, Big Sister. That's how I get kids in my life. And I volunteered for a seniors organization. But I'd be interested in seeing the percentage of Canadians who actually have time want to go out to volunteer versus what it, the case was what the case was maybe 30, 40 years well, ago. Well, they do it now because they get, they get credits for it for high school. High school kids, yes. But adults, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, most of us will know Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone. Yep which uh, he wrote, what was it, 20 years ago now, even more, mm. which uh, analyzed how Americans actually tend to go out less, volunteer less, go to even to churches less, and that, that's a trend that continued in big North American cities. So I think that, as a practice of citizenship, is great, volunteering for different organizations. But that we can make it mandatory, I don't think that would work. Paul, is there any appetite on Parliament Hill that you can see for a year's mandatory national service of some kind? There's a hell of a lot of, of, of such appetite in the prime minister's office. He used to work in an organization called Katimovic, and he, uh, he, he tried really hard to um, uh, increase the role that a, a group called We Charity played during the lockdown. And that <laughs> it was in some of the papers. You might have heard it didn't go well. Didn't go um, well. I like, I like Ginny Roth's instincts. She's, she's, she's constantly trying to produce a sort of a, a positive conservatism that Canadians can rally around. I think she would be appalled at some of the suggestions that people would have for her proposed national service program. I don't know why, uh, in an era of near constant climate disaster, people wouldn't be sandbagging against floods and ditch digging against wildfires. I don't know why they wouldn't be volunteering in uh, Indigenous friendship centers and uh, opioid uh, treatment centers. Uh, you know, this, this, this might turn into a vision of a national Canadian volunteerism that uh, elements of which Ginny might find uh, a little disappointing. Similarly, when we're asking where, where are the national uh, symbols that we can rally around, Ian Williams won the Giller Prize in 2019 for his book Reproduction, one of the best Canadian novels I've uh, ever read. Uh, there are, uh, Ian Williams is black. There are elements of, 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 of uh, racial politics in the book, and there's also uh, a very clear-eyed uh, depiction of suburban life in modern Canadian cities that I think an awful lot of us who don't look like Ian Williams could absolutely identify with. Kevin Loring wrote a play that just got played at the National Arts Centre called Little Red and His Lawyer, which is about an Indigenous guy pressing a land claim. It's one of the most brutally funny and clear-eyed Canadian plays that I've seen in a long time. Uh, the water is fine. Everyone can jump in and join this conversation. Uh, if, if those of us who had a microphone a little earlier would simply seed it once in a while. Hmm. Well, I'm going to seed the microphone to Ken Coates for one last comment here in our last minute. Ken, what about it? As a, as a step towards a shared national identity, Ginny Roth's idea of a year's worth of mandatory service, what say you? I think it would be a disaster, and I think the I think the sort of a, the kind of political fallout from trying to do that would just show all sorts of problems. When she mentions the fact that we're going to put them in the military, you've got to be joking. Our military is so massively underfunded, has struggles doing the most basic fundamental things, and the idea that unleashing a bunch of 19-year-olds in and to work in the military is going to somehow solve the problem. 
um, not within the next two or three generations. So I love the optimism. I don't think you can force this kind of stuff. I love the other comments people are making. Um, basically, this is not something going to come from the politicians. If we're going to sort of have a national project, if we're going to get excited about Canada's future, it comes from Canadians. It doesn't come from, from Canadian politicians. Well, with Canada Today just a few days away, I want to thank all six of you for joining us on the agenda tonight. Margaret McMillan, Ken Coates, Paul Wells, Akash Maharaj, Daniel Bernhardt, Lydia Perovich. Uh, this was really great. And I thank you all for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Take good care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.